We did about 100 deals that year, you know, in 2015. And then from there, I recognized the power of partnerships, you know, and finding people that can, you know, generate leads for us. So that's been our approach. Our, our growth has been due to our strategic partnerships. Welcome everyone to the podcast. I'm your host, James Prendamano. We're joined today by Rod Stanback. He's the CEO of Flip Funding. Uh, his website's www.flipfunding.com. Rod has funded over $500 million in real estate deals. Uh, essentially, he created Flip Funding to eliminate the hassle and possibility of, of going into a deal and, and quite honestly being taken advantage of through the hard money process. I've got a bazillion questions, Rod. Thank you so much for taking the time today. No problem. Thank you for having me, James. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we jump into the, the nuts and bolts of your platform, um, I, I like to talk about kind of your, your history for a little bit. I find there's common threads between entrepreneurs and folks that are kind of in the, the game that we're in. So, you know, how did real estate end up even in, you know, in your interest zone? Was there mentors when you were a kid or was anybody else in the game? You know, as a kid, I, I didn't have any mentors, you know, but I've always heard that real estate was the route to go. You know, uh, I didn't know anybody that was investing in real estate. I may have known people with one, you know, people with one or two properties, but nobody that took it, you know, serious as a business. Um, but how I found my way into real estate was I went to college. That didn't work out. I went up there acting like a knucklehead, got kicked out. Me too. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm glad it did because I wouldn't be here today, you know, so everything get everything happened for a reason, this blessing in disguise. So um, I got kicked out, came home and was working with Applebee's and, you know, doing a bunch of other stuff. And, you know, I had, a, I had an epiphany, you know, I'm looking up and I said, well, wait a minute, you know, this is not how I envisioned my life to be after high school, you know? So I said I had to make, I had to make some drastic decision, you know, to, to make something happen. So uh, real estate was hot at the time. This was about 2015, 2016, you know, the market was booming. So, you know, I didn't have the money to get into real estate, but I wanted to align myself within the industry. So I went back and I'm from Philadelphia originally. So I live in Maryland now, but I went to Delaware County Community College for carpentry. Um, that's in the suburbs of Philly. I got my license, well, I got my certificate. Then I started subcontracting for Home Depot, doing doors and windows. You know, I, I love that actually, but then, you know, I transitioned into remodeling property. So my brother, his best friend had a remodeling company and it was actually, they were doing jobs for an investor from New York. You know, a lot of you guys come down to Philadelphia because it's a little more affordable there, you know, so you can buy numerous properties in comparison to one that you may purchase in New York. So mm -hmm. he was down there and he was taking properties in the Temple University area and we were converting them from, they were converting warehouses to student housing. And, you know, from doing that process, you know, I learned about remodeling the ins and outs of remodeling that overcame my fear of the of handling the managing these projects and everything but you know i, I had, had another epiphany and, and i thought to myself i'm like wait a minute you know this guy is making a killing and we're on the bottom of the totem pole but we're doing all the labor you know what i mean so i said i have to get on the other end and so um i was saving my money at the time at the time i was working doing that i was working at a restaurant and doing other things on the side, doing whatever I can to raise my money. But then, you know, lo and behold, the market crashed, which was a blessing in disguise for me. You know, I didn't know anything about what was going on in the market at the time, but I just knew I was saving my money. A guy came to me with the uh, opportunity of a lifetime to, in my eyes, you know, it was two properties for $10,000. So I didn't ask any questions. I gave him the money. He gave me the, the, the deeds and it was a done deal. You know, I thought so. And this was 2019 at the time. So um, I took one of the properties, remodeled it, and actually took a shot and listed it for sale. Coincidentally, it was under contract in two weeks, but they asked me for the HUD. You know, I didn't know what the heck they were talking about at the time, you know? So they asked me how I acquired the property. I told them, then they immediately referred me to an attorney. Um, so I explained the situation to the attorney. He told me that, you know, it was a fraudulent transaction. And then he just so happened to know the guy who sold me the property because this attorney was doing pro bono work for this kid's, uh, I mean, this guy's children and, you know, in family court. 
And, you know, he asked me if I wanted to pursue him in court, but he was a con artist. I knew I wouldn't get anything. It would be a waste of time, you know, a waste of money for me as well. So just that I just wanted to do whatever we can to resolve it and move on. So what we had to do was a quiet title process. Um, for those of you who don't know, a quiet title process is when you have to find the, the rightful owner of the property. So we have to put three put in um, three ads in the, in the paper for three weeks consecutively. Um, try to find, you know, either the heir or a relative who will claim this property. And if they decided they want the property, then I was out of luck. You know what I mean? Um, that I would have just been out of all of my money and that would have been a tough pill to swallow, obviously. Um, luckily, no one responded, you know, so we had uh, private investigators send the certified mail to family members' homes, the, the previous address of the for the prior owner, but she had passed away. So, you know, we had to try to find a relative, but we weren't successful and which worked out in my favor. So I got to keep the property, you know, thank God. It was a hell of a learning experience, you know, to say the least. Um, well, the second one, you know, cause it was two properties, remember the second one was actually a duplex. I wasn't so lucky with that one, you know? So again, the properties were sitting vacant for a while. The guy did his research and he knew that the property owners were deceased. So he figured no one would come, but this property, the areas, they had moved to California, you know, well, so their last uh, vision of the property, you know, it was in shambles. So uh, when we contacted them, they told me to just give them 3000 and they, they would move on. So I happily cut the check and, you know, that was my, uh, that was my entrance into the real estate game. Man, oh man, I'm always fascinated by people that put so much time and energy into doing things the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> when if you put that time and energy into doing things the right way, you can make a hell of a lot more money. Nobody gets hurt along the way. And um, unfortunately, there's so much that goes into a real estate transaction. And, you know, uh, what, what, what Rod's talking about here is essentially if someone passes away and there's no claim to the property, it has to go somewhere, right? So uh, unsettled estates, depending on where you're located, can go to a number of different jurisdictions. And in Rod's case, they basically just had to play some ads and nobody claimed, you know, made a claim to the first one at least and was able to transfer title that way. Um, you know, if, traditionally, when you're doing transactions, uh, you want to make sure you have a title report, folks, and, yes. and understand exactly what the chain of title is and make sure it's insurable. Uh, all your deals should be subject to marketable title where possible. Um, you know, you, you, you got lucky there. Um, and I guess that's what kind of kicked the whole thing off for you, right? Absolutely. absolutely. So after that, I worked backwards, you know, like you, you're absolutely right. You know, the proper way is to get educated, get a mentor, you know, do your, do your due diligence pri prior to, you know, moving forward and purchasing your first property. But I was so gung ho and excited, you know, I thought I had a deal of a lifetime. So I, you know, and I had no idea that you can just create a deed, you know what I mean? I thought it was some, at, at the time, I thought it was just like an official government document that, you know, only they can produce. So I was naive and, you know, it was a learning experience, but, you know, like you said, after that, I went in, you know, I had, I, I got a mentor and, um, you know, I, I read every book, you know, all the courses and everything until I got educated and then there's I decided a, to proceed. There's a ton of information out there now. There are so yeah. many courses and I know you have a pamphlet on your site. Uh, that you just have to put your email address in and, and it gives you some of the, the details and basics and principles of hard money lending and funding. There's so much free info out there right now. It's like an amazing time um, to to dip your toe in the water, quite honestly, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Jay, it can be a gift and a curse as well because like you said, there's too much information and everyone's not legit, you know? So, you know, make sure you do your research on whomever, you know, you're consuming information from. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. So your platform um, has something called the profitable pairing process, correct? Yes. So if you could first talk about hard money lending, just mm -hmm. you could talk the audience through what it is, and then talk to us a little bit about the profitable pairing process, and then we can jump in from there. Sure. So hard money for those of you uh, who are not, you know, informed, we're essentially an alternative financing option to traditional financing. So, you know, we traditional financing, they typically focus on, you know, 
owner occupied properties where so hard money where exclusively commercial business even though it can be a one to four unit like a residential property because it's an investment purpose it's considered a commercial deal or a commercial transaction so we only focus on business purpose loans non-owner occupied and you know we don't require tax returns um, you know, and it, we can also get loans done a lot faster, you know, whereas though traditional nowadays, you know, they're, they're pretty fast as well. But, you know, we can get loans done as quick as five days, you know, for the long. And, and right now it's tough because of appraisals. So, I mean, in general, right now, on average, our bridge loans or fix and flips or short term loans are averaging about two weeks to close. That's pretty remarkable turnaround. I mean, even in any market, two weeks to close to close is is crazy. But in this market, that's that's kind of ridiculous. So, the 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 trade off, folks, is instead of going to institutional debt and going through an exhaustive process of documents and follow up and more documents and the all of the regulations, these are non QM field loans, so they're not nearly as regulated. Uh, and you obviously you pay a premium in pricing rate wise, right? Yeah. So uh, can you talk us through, you know, like a, a standard fix and flip? Let's talk LTVs. Let's talk rate. Uh, are you funding just the acquisition? Do you also provide construction money? Just give me a, a typical rundown if you could. So we're typically, I would say we're a one-stop shop. And when it comes to one to four unit properties, you know, uh, we do fix and flip. We do bridge. So a bridge loan, for those who aren't aware, a bridge loan is a short-term loan, typically 12 to 24 months. So, you know, we do bridge loans, fix and flip loans, uh, buy and hold for rentals. You know, we do cash out or acquisition, um, you know, on that side. We do five plus units, you know, bridge, short-term. You know, we don't do any uh, long-term for commercial properties, but we do five plus, anywhere from five to 300 units for fix and flips. Um, we also do mixed use commercial properties, but that's where it stops. We don't do did, any, you know. Commercial. Did you say five to 300 units you're doing fix and flips? Yes. Wow. Yep. And we are providing, yep, rehab funds as well. So we provide 100% of the rehab funds up to 90% of the purchase price. Okay. So let's, let's, let's say I come to you with a, a 20 unit deal that mm -hmm. is in need of, uh, you know, all sorts of, of repair. It's, it's under market because of the, the condition of the property. It's not tenanted or sparsely tenanted. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say I've got a strike price of $500,000, right? That's my contract price. We appraise. There's no problem there. How much do I got to put down? For, so for commercial, I have to backtrack a bit. So I said up to 90% of the purchase price, 100% of rehab costs. That's for one to four units. So for the five plus units, we max at a 80%, um, 80%. So you have to bring 20% of the purchase price and then we would cover you know, the remaining 80% towards the acquisition and we would give you 100% of the rehab costs. So, so you know, about a hundred grand down. So I've got to come in with a hundred thousand down, which is nothing on a five hundred thousand dollar transaction if it's twenty units because of the type of loan. Right. You're going to fund the four hundred grand. Now let's say I've got to put, you know, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars in per unit. So I've got another million dollars I've got to put into this rehab, um, and the stabilized appraised value is there. Everything checks out. You're you're also funding some of that rehab money too. 100% of it. 100% of the yes. rehab money? Yes, even if it exceeds the purchase price, which a lot of people won't do. A lot of people don't like, they call it upside down loans where the purchase price exceeds the rehab, I mean, where the rehab amount exceeds the purchase price. And a lot of lenders don't like those. They don't have appetite for those deals, but we do. You know, It's all about the numbers for us. As long as that ARV is high enough to where though, you know, the numbers make sense and, you know, we'll do that deal all day. So... Folks, just to give you perspective, I've been doing this for 25 years. I have perfect credit. I've got a couple of bucks in the bank. We've been blessed. I just bought a primary home, my home, where I'm going to live, okay? Because I'm self-employed, I had to put 30% down, hmm. and I'm paying almost 6%. So you're talking about 
20%, and that's through an institutional lender. You're talking about 20% down on the acquisition and 100%, as long, of course, as long as appraisals are there and the stabilized value is there, of the, of the rehab, even if it exceeds the purchase price. Absolutely. First time I've ever heard that. Yes, sir. Yeah. First time I've ever heard it. Let's talk rates. What am I in All for? Right. How, many, how many points and what do the rates look like? So, I mean, as you know, it's competitive. So right now, you know, our max interest rate, even for a first time investor right now, we're starting out at 10 and a half percent. You know, we're not exceeding that. Um, the lowest interest rate that we'll, we can offer on a bridge loan, um, bridge, fix and flip, new construction is about 7.49%. But that's for someone who's done about at least 10 deals in the past three years. And it's points. Okay. We, yeah. And points on right. average. Yeah. So on average, we do two and a half points, three points for us, a newbie just coming in. You know, if you have somewhat experienced two and a half, but if you're highly experienced and, and depending on the deal size, anywhere from one and a half to two points. All right. So again, I want to give the audience a little perspective. Yep. My first land deal uh, we do a lot of entitlement work. Like we find the land and, and we know how to work through the process. The process is very difficult in New York to get things approved. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought a piece of land, we got it approved and, and sold it. The whole transaction, we were in and out in three months. I paid 18% and a point in, a point out. And I had to guarantee a minimum of, a, it was either six or eight months of interest. So even though they got the money back, in half the time, I still had to pay the minimum required amount of time in interest. Now, you may think, folks, like, that's crazy. That's insane. It was in a different time, granted. But for me, you know, when I was starting out, I didn't have access to big capital. I needed a high LTV. And, you know, it was go get a partner and syndicate at 50%, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Have yes. someone come in and put up the money and they take half the deal or roll the dice, pay the 18 plus two. And, you know, it turned out to be a nice deal. It worked out. Um, but I haven't seen LTVs like this anywhere. Um, you do, when you say commercial, are you doing actual commercial real estate deals or just the classification meaning commercial because it's over four family. Yeah, the, so that the, the only commercial we do is over four family, you know, multi-units and mixed use commercial. We don't go into like the warehouses, industrial or any of the other asset types. All right, so if you're able to pr provide this type of, of service, um, I have to ask, wh where is the funding coming from? Uh, you're, you're clearly not just a middleman outsourcing this stuff because there's there's just no room in the rate, right? I mean, right. we're paying this on the retail side. We're paying more than this on the retail side. We're not getting 100% on construction. We rarely get 80% on acquisition. And, you know, we've been doing this for two decades at this point. So mm -hmm. how, how are you sourcing the fund to put this together? And then what are you doing with the loan after it's written? So actually you know so i have the fund but these so my existing model we don't use the fund you know we're not using the fund so our model is once we fund it we're i fund it with my capital and i have some private investors as well we'll fund deals with our with my with our capital and then we'll sell it immediately to a third-party institution and you know they're actually the main you know uh institution that we're selling our loans to are actually in new york um you know we have a a huge variety, but we prefer to work with this institution because it's the, it's a better process and it allows us to guarantee a better experience for our borrowers. So you know that's why we utilize these guys. But um, you know I've been in, I've been in around I've been in you know financing not as long as you've been in you know the real estate, but this has been what I've been doing since full time since 2013. So I'm making my business to be aware of all of the ins institutions that are in the game and you know compare their services, you know, their appetites and everything to see which one would be beneficial to, you know, to flip funding and what we're trying to accomplish in our, in our, in our business. So I'm certainly not going to ask you who your outlet is because that's, that's gold for you and God bless you for getting it. But, but I'll let you know, I can let you know off air, you know, I'll let you know, James, no problem. 
you know, uh, I would like to just talk to the audience about some mistakes I've seen in this field where mm -hmm. when they get in, folks want to raise a ton of capital and they want to put out as much as they can up front and they have not buttoned up the back end, which is selling the note, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is, unfortunately, they don't calculate for any hiccups in the market. They don't calculate for when things go a little bit sideways. Um, they raise the money and folks, when investors are wiring in, you're paying interest the minute that hits your account. They don't care if you found a deal yesterday or if you don't find a deal for the next five years, when their money hits, you're paying. So folks go out and they get so focused on raising this capital up front that the pipeline isn't being built out the right way and they're self-funding these transactions and they're trying to, you're always grinding, right? If, if, if you're in real estate, anyone who's in this game knows nothing goes the way it's supposed to go. Time was ever, right? Like there's yeah. always a delay, there's always a title issue, there's always an appraisal you know, review, there's always something, that's just part of it. But with proper planning, uh, you can get ahead of a lot of that mess. And what Rod's doing here is not focusing so much on, on having this massive tranche of capital to tap to continue to fund the deals. I would suspect that you've got all of your guidelines, you know what the, the volume is that your investors are gonna, you know, the institutional people are gonna buy it for, you know yeah. what criteria they want, and you know that if you hit these benchmarks, they're buying the loan. Absolutely. All right. So are you even servicing it for a day or are you at the table right right off the hop? Is it being assigned? Right off the hop, right after right the settlement, that, that the loan is being assigned. So we're not we are managing the servicing process. So the borrower contact, well, not the servicing, the draw process. Even those third party, you know, fund managing that the draws, well, handling the draw releases, we still manage the process. So the borrower still will contact us, let us know that. They're done this phase, you know, they're ready for an inspection. So we will, we will, we'll, you know, contract the inspector, have them go out once they, you know, um, let us know that the work was a, uh, was completed as agreed or, or as stated from the borrower, then, you know, we'll go ahead and notify the servicer and then release the funds. All right. So again, you, you got a great process here. I want to, I want to walk the audience through the back end transaction so they understand why there's an appetite for it. Because at, when I first heard about this years ago, it didn't make sense to me. Why would someone be buying the, these notes for you and how do you make money if they're taking the note? So yeah. if it's a $500,000 transaction, we have a $400,000 loan and let's say there's $250,000 in, in construction money that you need. And let's say it's someone who's done less than 10 in the last couple of years. So you got three points. So we've got 15,000 in points, you've got uh, $400,000, let's call it 11% or 10% just for easy numbers. What mm -hmm. is your minimum hold time? How long do they have to keep the loan? Well, so so that one is tricky. So I'll go back to the profitable pairing process. Uh, well, so we have we have uh, different options, you know, as far as institutional buyers. So some do have a, a requirement and some don't. Uh, the main institutional buyer that we work with, they don't, you know, so... Um, there's no no prepayment penalty at all. You can literally close a loan today, sell it tomorrow, no penalty. But then, you know, we have another institutional buyer. The maximum is three months. So a lot of them, they want at least three months of payments. You can understand why, you know, they want to make sure they're getting a, a decent profit on this investment. But, you know, three months is the max. So let's say it is three months, mm -hmm. which is, again, ridiculous right so i mean really it, it is a three-month minimum is there's not that's we're not talking about a lot of money we're talking about fifteen thousand in payments yeah. right so we have fifteen thousand in points we have fifteen thousand in payments plus we have on the 250 we got another call it another five grand six grand on the construction. So we're talking about 31,000 in, no, 36,000 roughly minimum profit on the loan. So the par value of the loan is 400,000. You go sell it to the investor. What, right. did, what are they roughly paying you? Roughly. About six, well, six and a half, seven percent. 
six and a half, seven percent above. Yes, sir. All right. So they're paying six and a half to seven percent above that number. And no, I'm sorry, James, not above that number. So they'll but then my coupon, my coupon rate that they'll purchase the loan off of me is it would be six percent. And it. so anything above is the spread. Got it. So they're buying the loan back at par, mm -hmm. right? And then yeah. you're you're in between the six and a half and the 10, 11, 12, nine, whatever it is. Yeah. And you stay in uh, with servicing because you're collecting and then you're paying the bank or are you just, are you bifurcating that payment? How does that work? Are they paying? It's ACH. It's a automated ACH. So I don't really, I'm not involved in the payments per se, but the, the rehab draws, we are managing that process. Man, oh man. And then on the rehab draws, I'm sure there's, you know, $500 inspection every time and, you know, 200, yeah. 200. Gee, mm -hmm. man, how come you are not on this show <laughs> this long, man? We've got a lot of work to do. You're lending in New York? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're nationwide. Yeah. So $200 inspections. And you're keeping the spread between that six and a half and whatever you were able to win the deal for on the yep. face value. Yeah. And it, let's say I have an investor on that. I'll even let you know, you know, how I pay my investors. So, you know, you see that spread is anywhere between three to four, an additional yield spread, three to four percent. So I pay my investors one percent on that loan, you know, which is great because it's not one percent per it's one percent per deal. And remember, I'm selling it. I'm selling that loan. So my whole time on that loan is only about one week, two at the max. So I'm giving that investor one percent for one or two weeks. This is a, a great model that you got here, Rod. So let's talk about the core business itself. You guys are now lending across the country in yes. in a, a pretty, you know, all things considered, this is a short period of time. Like this is explosive growth. And, and I understand the explosive growth. Now, to be honest, when I'm, we're doing homework leading into it, I didn't quite understand how the growth was so explosive because there's a lot of, of people in the hard money space now but mm -hmm. now that I understand your, your loan terms, I get it. Now, how did you scale that? You know, how did you, social media, websites, you've got a, a great following on LinkedIn. You got a great following on Insta, great following on Twitter and Facebook. How did all those pieces come together? So believe it or not, you know, it wasn't any of those platforms that you named, you know, so I consider, I don't consider myself, you know, with it. Well, LinkedIn is pretty decent, but like social media, I'm not the most active guy on there, you know, and that's like a crucial tool to grow your business. But for me, you know, um, I took, I sort of took the grassroots uh, approach. So I started out, I didn't start out with this model. I started out actually brokering loans, you know, um, I learned the game from a guy, he's actually a hard money lender, but you know, he essentially taught me how to broker loans to his company. So I really didn't have the skills that I thought I was equipped with in, you know, the first like 50, no, not even exaggerating, the first 50 transactions I tried to get funded, none of them worked with this guy, you know, that I tried to work with because his program was just horrible. So it forced me to go out there and get some other resources. So started out, you know, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Lending Home. Mm -hmm. So that was like my bread and butter in 2015. That was my primary lender. So we were the top broker with them. So how we scaled the business, even the first year, I'll let you know, we didn't do, well, we did one transaction the entire year. You know, um, luckily in December, we closed one loan. Uh, and that was 2014. Then 2015, I found Lending Home. They had a great product. And, you know, I put it out there. And we did great that year because we tapped into uh, a guy who was a student of the Armando Montalongo course and every all the graduates from there were they were all excited ready to go so you know he plugged them right into us he was he was I was a broker but he was essentially a broker for me he was funneling all of those deals from Armando Montalongo's class to us and we did about 100 deals that year you know in 2015 and then from there I recognized the power of partnerships you know and finding people that can you know, generate leads for us. So that's that's been our approach. You know, our our growth has been due to our strategic partnerships. Look, word of mouth, it's a slower process. But when you've got a product like this, boy, you know that that that's that's. It, I'm I'm I, I don't get speechless often, but I got to tell you, man, these these rates, these LTVs are 
are just, they're unheard of up here. Let me ask you about land. Are you doing land deals? No, only if you're going, only if you're going to build on it, you know, immediately, but we don't do just land only, only if it's in conjunction with a new construction project. All right. If you come across anyone that's doing uh, land deals where, you know, you're, you're purchasing for X and it's worth Y because of the entitlement process, mm -hmm. we do a lot of that. And there, there's, there's big swings. I mean, there's 60, 70, 80, a hundred percent increases in value based on the entitlements at the end of the day. Uh, I'd love to talk to somebody about that, but okay. you know, when over the last year and a half, a like coronavirus has just caused so much difficulty in, in real estate, although we're adapting pretty quickly. What has the deal flow been like for you guys? Are you, is it dropped off? Is it picking up? What's happened over the last year and a half or so? Surprisingly, so obviously once the market, you know, once coronavirus first hit, you know, the, it was so much uncertainty, capital markets pulled out. And so I actually, I actually, you know, that's when my model kind of blew up in my face a bit, you know, so um, it wasn't horrible, but it was just one specific loan that was cleared for the purchase. But as soon as they got wind of, you know, the market, the market shutting down, obviously they were Nick and I got stuck with that on my books. You know, it was only one loan, so it wasn't, you know, um, a major, I mean, a major issue or anything, but it did, t you know, it made me uh, a bit precautionary moving forward and made me think about, you know, better models to where, so if this doesn't happen again, you know, whereas though I don't get stuck with, you know, all these loans. Um, can you, I'm sorry, I got off track a bit. Can you repeat the yeah. question? No, no, you, you, you answered the question. I mean, okay. it's remarkable that you, you only got stuck with one loan. So yeah. you're, Post coronavirus, let's talk about the appetite of the institutional buyers of your loans. Uh, we're seeing big companies, uh, some of the biggest banks in the world are dumping $500 billion a night into the overnight, into the Fed. And they're taking a few basis points. They're losing money every day because mm -hmm. they're afraid to enter back into the market, right? So uh, the jury is still out when that money is gonna hit the street. But in the interim, your guys and their institutional, semi-institutional, I assume they're like a REIT or a fund or something like that, they yeah. still have an appetite? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, I mean, they have even more of an appetite now. You know, um, honestly, I'm not sure what exactly it is. But, you know, there's a lot more institutional players in the game now, and they have a stronger appetite for, you know, these, these investment loans. Um, I think, you know, they're seeing the value in comparison to the traditional loans, you know, they, I, I believe the return is a lot higher. I'm sure the return is a lot higher for them in comparison to traditional loans. So I think that's really what's creating the demand in this uh, sector from capital markets. Yep. No, no doubt about it. So, you know, I've been through now four once in a lifetime events in real estate, you know, being in New York, 9-11 was a once in a lifetime. 2008 crash was once in a lifetime. Superstorm Sandy once in a lifetime and now coronavirus. So I'm, I've, I've got four lifetimes of no headaches ahead of me in this, in this business. But um, that said, it seems that these, these anomaly events are, are becoming not such an anomaly anymore. So, you know, are you thinking about when the music stops yet? Are you thinking about what, what the model looks like when the markets start to dry up and those rates start creeping and the stimulus runs out? You know, have you guys got that far ahead in your business plan yet? So that's, you know, well, that's where the fun comes in, you know, because, you know, once the pandemic hit and, you know, was everybody backed out of, you know, the market, no one was lending, then I was stuck. You know, I had a huge demand because there was no competition, you know, so it was a great opportunity to be lending at the time. But if you're dependent upon the capital markets and these institutions, you're stuck, you know, so you have to kind of take things into your own hands and that's where the fun comes in. So I've had the fun since 2016, you know, but I found this model that I'm doing now and I thought, you know, this makes a little more sense. It reduces the risk, you know, because we're not holding on to the notes. And to me, it was like a no brainer, but, you know, at the same time, we need more control. So when, you know, things do happen, like you said, in, 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 the, in the world, you know, we we have we we decide our fate. You know, and not you know some third party, because we missed out on a lot of opportunities. So therefore, you know, I'm planning on just going on an aggressive you know capital raise, 
you know, like you mentioned, you know, that can be a dangerous game for most people if you don't have, you know, the pipeline to back it up and deploy all those funds, you know, because then you're still going to have to pay interest and you can be out of the game as soon, you know, faster than you got in, you know. But, um, you know, we're going to hold in the near future, we're definitely going to hold everything in, on the books. We're going to manage the servicing. We may still, you know, outsource to a third party servicing. We don't want to put too much on our plates, but, you know, just having the control of the funds and those actual loans will help us maintain for the longevity. So if I can share with you, um, having been through four cycles, I've seen what the fallout looks like. Um, something we're doing that I'd love to talk to you about offline. Uh, we're, we're putting together the, the structure for a fund now. Um, when the music stops, you know, there's a, a period of time where the big, the big guys, whoosh, they get alligator arms and all that capital comes off the table, just like you saw when coronavirus hit, right? Mm -hmm. It's literally, people don't understand this. It's there one day and then it's gone the next. Yeah. One, of, one or two of the big players pull that money off the table and man, it, it sweeps through everybody. And now all of a sudden there's zero capital available. There's notes that are maturing that were performing notes. Everything was going yeah. great. You can't refi out of them in the institutional way. You can't refi out of them in the hard money way. You're kind of getting stuck. So um, having seen this and you know, one transaction in particular, I'll tell you about that we did in 2000, I think it was 2000. 10 the music stopped nobody kind of even know what hit them for a year because that was obviously a, you know when bear Stearns go shit's going down right that was <laughs> again an anomaly but um we had a, a a note that we negotiated uh it was an institutional lender uh the buyer sought us out we negotiated a short sale they bought a it was two buildings that were wrapped. They were about 80% complete in construction. It was 60 some odd million in the note left. The purchase price was significantly higher than that, but just the note oh. had 62, 63 million. We negotiated it for 20 million or 20 and a half million dollars. This fund came in and bought it um, and finished the construction. And as things opened up 2011, 2012, we went to market with those condos. Our sellout was over $105 million. And they were in for 20.5 plus, call it five, six million in, in finishing up the construction and mm -hmm. carrying costs. So what I what I want to do now is I want to put together a fund for when that music stops and eight, 10, 12 months passes, and people really have to make a move, not mm -hmm. the individual who owns it the banks, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be able to buy those notes at a steep discount, but I want to be able to leverage. I don't want to have to drain the fund. I want to be able to find leverage to buy those defaulted notes. If you've got a solid business plan and you're in a good market and you've got comps, man, it's a wildly profitable opportunity. Oh, so yeah. I wonder if you guys can kick around, you know, thinking about two, three, four years from now when the music stops, because again, folks, it's going to stop. Oh, yeah. It does not last forever. It never does. And, you know, one, one of the things we joke about is, is up here when your dentist, you know, and, and your chiropractor is telling you about the 20 unit rehab that they're doing, get out. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's when it's yeah. time to sell and, and get out. No disrespect to doctors, of course, but what happens is it's just, they watch, everyone watches people making so much money in it. And then, you know, there's a lot to, to look out for and people make mistakes. Um, you know, why I, it's part of why I think the passive income funds have become so popular because people want a piece of real estate. They want a piece of that action, but they don't want to be on the working side of the partnership. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, they don't want to deal with contractors, toilets and tenants. You know? Yep. You know, guys like you are giving them an opportunity there. So I'd love to talk to you at some point offline about maybe we could put something in place where as we're sourcing these notes and, and bringing capital to the table, I'd love to be able to find leverage to buy the defaulted note. Absolutely. All right. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I got way off track here because I got excited and I, I tend to do that. The audience knows about my Tweety Birds. I kind of <laughs> get going there. 
the profitable pairing process. Can you talk to us yep. a little bit about what that is? Yes. So the profitable pairing process in that, so our system, we do have a box, you know, but we are not uh, limited to the box, you know, the box that we have, you know, listed on a website and everything like that. When I say box, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, our credit terms and, you know, the rates, and, uh, the, the leverage and everything. That's our preferred program that we like to utilize that we, you know, like to utilize for the institution in New York. We know with that, with working with that institution, you know, it's a seamless process. And again, we can ensure a great loan experience for our borrowers. But at the end of the day, we have, and there's other people in the, in the industry, right? And everyone has different appetites for different types of loans and there's different caveats to, you know, their program. So the perfect, the profit paying process is once someone submits a loan to flip funding, we take the, let's take a look at the scenario. And then we give the borrower a call just to find out exactly what their goals are, you know, what they're trying to accomplish because everyone's situation is unique. Everyone doesn't have the same goal, you know? So based on that goal, we decide, we compare all the programs that we have at our disposal and, and determine what's going to be the best route to get them, you know, to accomplish what, what, they, what they're trying to do. So you're, you're, you've got the intake because you've got so many outlets, folks, that we're doing fix and flips, bridge loans, rental, new construction, multifamily, mixed use and commercial, again, defined as non-QM field, four family or more. You're... Yeah taking them in, you're taking a look at experience, you're taking, are you looking at credit and are you looking at assets? Yeah, we're looking at credit. We're looking at assets, you know, only to make sure that they have enough for the down payment and they have enough capacity to make the monthly payments. But we don't look at your income or anything like that because we understand that, you know, you may be using a partner or someone like that. So we don't care about your income, just as long as you have the ability, the willing and the ability to pay. So if I've got credit and cash, I can get funded. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk real quick just to define credit. Is it 700, 750, 800? What kind of credit are you looking for, you know, as a minimum on the way in? So for a bridge, fix and flip, new construction, we have a minimum of 600. And also for rental loans, we have a minimum of 600, which is unheard of. So it is but it's like, Jesus. Yeah, but now there's one catch though. For the for the 600, you won't qualify for a 30 year fixed loan. However, you'll get a 5 one arm, 10 one arm, 7 one arm, you know, and that'll give buy you enough time in case you know you're back against the wall. You need to refinance and get out of a product, you know, get out of a loan. You this is an option for you temporarily until you increase your credit and can then you know roll into a 30 year fixed loan. Time out, time out. You're doing more than two year terms oh, on yeah. any product. No, not on, not on the, uh, that's only for like the buy and hold products. No, no, no. I meant like on any product, like you're doing it even on one product, you're going beyond two, three years. Oh yeah, absolutely. And which product are you doing that on? So we have, we have buy and hold programs too. So we do three, year, three, one arms, five, one arms, seven, one arms, and, and 10, one arms. And then it jumps to 30 year fixed. And what about the commercial stuff? like the fix and flips, bridges, rentals, new construction? 600, yep, still 600. And what? how long of a term? That's up to 24 months. Yep, those short term, yeah, the bridge loans are capped at 24 months. Okay, now do I need to have uh, almost all of our transactions we've done for two decades, single purpose LLCs, we're in, we're out, we, we file our taxes, we're good citizens, but then we, we shut it down, right? Because you don't want two, three, four, five, 10 transactions in one LLC, because if you have one issue, which happens, right? God forbid yeah. there's an injury with a worker or whatever, these things happen. You don't want to get wrapped across those other properties. Now, do you need the entity to have the credit or are you okay if we're doing single purpose LLCs and I personally have the credit? Yeah, it's just the individual has to, has to have the credit. You know, you can use any entity. It doesn't even have to be a single purpose entity, you know, actually, but um, yeah, it's just the individual has to meet their credit threshold. And full personal guarantees, right? Yes. And are you getting like confessions of judgments or anything like that up front? No, we do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. We include that in our loan documents. And how many would you say percentage wise you've had to foreclose on? 5%.
man, this is good stuff. Yeah. This is really good stuff. Um, just some general questions for you. You know, if you can go back a couple of years, mm -hmm. what advice would you give yourself? Go back maybe five years from things that you've learned now. You know, five years ago, honestly, five years ago, I would have tried to, well, you know, I would have, hmm, that's a good question because I would have, because I wasn't raising money at the time, you know, I wasn't directly lending and, you know, this is obviously a much better position because the control, you know, and because the thing I didn't like about being a broker is because you get blamed no matter how hard you try, like you said, nothing ever goes right. And it's, it's the worst when you try, it's the, your, your hardest, you bend over backwards and things happen. It's not your fault, but you still get the blame. You know, you got to stand in front of that bullet regardless of what happens. And that's the worst feeling ever, you know, just being, having a lack of control. Um, so, you know, um, being in this position now, I am, I, that I'm in now is, is awesome. But, you know, I, I started to say that I would have, you know, started raising funds prior to, you know, five years ago, but I wasn't ready at that time. You know, I honestly wasn't ready. I didn't have the, the proper team in place and all that stuff is important. You know, like I said, I would have put the cart before the horse and I probably would have been out of business right now because my, my reputation may have, might have been mud, you know? So yep. um, honestly, five years, I would have just focused on, you know, just making sure that my team was more solid, you know, um, everything was more, it was, I was, I had a team, but everything was still hundred percent dependent upon me. I, I wasn't, I didn't know how to delegate properly. So, you know, that, that was crucial to me scaling the business, having a proper team that, you know, I can rely on and know that regardless of what's going on, the business is still, you know, moving in, in the way, the way I would be running it. And that, that's so hard, man. People don't give credit to it until they're in the position when you, you, you're trying to build something ground up and you're just grinding, you know, there's kind of a, this thing right now that it's, it's sexy to trade in your nine to five and become an entrepreneur. And that's mm -hmm. cool, but people don't see the immense sacrifice that goes into the backside of it. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks that, you know, it's, it's going to be such an easy transition, man, it is not. Like you said, it's sexy on social media and TV shows, you know what I mean? But yeah. they don't see the hard, the heartaches and stress and, you know, it doesn't stop. There is no nine to five. It's, it's no, there's no, there's no, you know, time off really, because when, when your day ends, you're still, you still have to use your brain, you know, you still got to think, you can stay ahead of the week, the year, you know, you just always have to think and people calling you, you know, constantly, it doesn't stop at all, you know, so like one thing for me, James, I had to learn balance. Uh, it got to a point where I felt as though I'm sure I was going to have a nervous breakdown or some type of breakdown. It, I was just overwhelmed, stressed, depressed, you know what I mean, making money, but I couldn't enjoy it. And if you can't enjoy it, then what's the, what's the use of it? You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I focus on balance, you know, and that's, that, that that's done tremendous things for my life did you get any coaching for that or did this just happen naturally for you i got a coach i got i did have Me i too. found a coach who you know um it actually went through similar similar he, you know of course he's an entrepreneur so he can relate he's been through it you know so he gave me some tips and you know things that i implemented into my life you know like like you know so Again, being an entrepreneur is rough and you feel like you just have to work, 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 work to dig yourself out of it. But you don't realize that you're killing you. You're slowly killing yourself. So you have to take time for yourself, whether it's meditation, a hobby, you know, take some time to just take your mind off of that work. And you'll find that you come back refreshed and you'll be more, much more effective. You and, know, And people, again, unless you're in it, you know, quick advice, folks. If you're looking to make the transition like Rod and I had, had touched on, make sure it's really measured and you understand fully what you're signing up for. And for those of you who are in the grind seven days a week doing what you do, you know, I was, I was the prime example. I was headed straight for a heart attack. You know, when uh, I went kicking and screaming to some coaching sessions to appease some of my team members because I knew better, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the exercises had, you know, my wife write down the last day I was off and she wrote down, we've been married 14 years. He's never taken a day off, including our wedding day when he had meetings. Wow. And it was that moment when I read it, 
like you know you're working every day you know you're always going but you don't you don't know it's it's so bizarre when you're in yeah. it you you really don't see what's happening and then you're you there's diminishing returns right it, it's mm -hmm. you start you start getting stressed and you're not thinking as clearly as you think you are you're shorter with the people around you you start holding yeah. them back right and uh you know the coach has i've got two coaches now they've they've basically taken me where friday afternoon to sunday morning i work sundays but friday afternoon friday night saturday you're not getting me yeah. and you know there's a fear like oh my big clients you know i have to answer believe me if yeah. you're good enough they're gonna not only are they gonna respect it they're gonna almost fear that they can't get you during that period of time and it's so critical man to take it to recharge if your family's your thing be with your family if fishing's your thing go fish but that little bit a week for me at least it's work mm -hmm. it's given me you know every week i come back and on sunday mornings i'm fired out of a cannon i feel great yeah and likewise and likewise you know my, my weekends you know I, I used to work seven days a week 24 7 yeah and like you said i, I was so focused on building my business i, I didn't want to let my clients down you know what i mean and i felt like i had to just show them that i was committed to their service but at the end of the day they understand they have they should understand and if, and if not somebody will you know what i mean so like your health is more important and what my coach told me to make me put things in perspective said when you're at, when you're at heaven's gates or whatever you know the last thing you're gonna say is ah, i wish i worked hard i wish i worked more but you will say you know i wish i would have spent more time with my kids so the, 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 the important things you know so that's what put things in perspective for me no no doubt man no rod this has been a, a fascinating chat how do people find you Oh, well, you can find me at Instagram, Rod, R-O-D underscore Flip Funding. Uh, you can visit the website, flipfunding.com. You can get, also give me a call, you know, 844-354-7386. That's 844-354-7386. My extension is 700. You may not get me, um, but, you know, uh, leave me a message and, you know, I'll certainly try, try to return a phone call. Rod Standback, Flip Funding, everybody. Thanks so much, Rod. Stay safe, bud.